about something that maybe is also kind of a little bit alien, maybe a little from another world. The Eli and Edith Broad Art Museum, which you've probably all seen starting to build on the campus of MSU. After 10 years in New York City and five years in San Francisco, I have moved my family to East Lansing because I am unbelievably excited about this thing that I understand from a lot of people I've talked to even today still seems a little bit like a mystery. So I want to tell you about why I'm here and why I think it's going to be important and exciting and maybe even interesting. Um, I'm here because I really believe that this is an amazing opportunity to start a new museum, but also come to a university where ideas are king, ideas are everything, and it's kind of a chance for me personally to sort of put my money where my mouth is a little bit in terms of curatorial vision and make shows that do what I think contemporary art needs to do, which is kind of change the world, change your perspective a little bit, ask you to think. I'm not I'm interested in art on the wall, I'm interested in beautiful pictures, I'm interested in painting and sculpture, but I'm really interested in the fact that contemporary art, contemporary artists offer us an unbelievable platform <coughs> to think about the major issues that confront us every day in our life. It's as important as ways of reading the newspaper to think about things, having conversations in classes. This is really going to be a place where you come and think about what's happening in your place and how does that reflect the world beyond you? Right now, I'm kind of obsessed with place because I've been here three months and I have no idea what the word home really means. But place is something that has been a really big part of my kind of artistic interest to date. This is the artist Mika Rottenberg and it's one of the shows I did at the very end of my time at San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. And Mika is all about place. She's Argentinian. She was raised in Israel, she lives and works in New York, and she is, in my mind, one of the best kind of political artists working today, but she doesn't hit you over the head with politics. Her work kind of seduces you and makes you laugh and is funny. The video we did in San Francisco was part of her practice where she creates these crazy narratives. She shot documentary footage in India of these workers who work at a rubber plant, and here you see the workers, and here you see the rubber that they're producing. She went to... Arizona, where she shot migrant farmers who cross the border and do lettuce farming, and she went there. And then, back in her studio in Harlem, she built this crazy structure, which was this satirical factory, a makeup factory. And when you watch this video, what happens is you see this woman who, in Mika's mind, kind of approximates the sort of stereotypical American factory worker. And she sits there, and you watch as her face gets squeezed between two planes, and her cheeks turn pink, and a little bit of fairy dust flakes off. And what you realize you're watching is this fantastical makeup factory, where blush is being made by the labor of a woman's activity, and her literal face becomes the blush that you will then put on your literal face. Mika uses the language of film to kind of collapse all of these things together, in each of the places she went, in India, she asked these women who sort of had no idea what this crazy video artist from New York was asking them to do, but they went along because she engaged them, she respected them, she talked to them about what they were doing. She asked them to reach their arms down into holes that had been dug in the ground, and here you see them filming that. In the video, you watch this crazy chamber where women's arms appear through a wall and they get manicures, and Mika had asked these young women, these Asian women from the manicure shop across the street in Harlem to come and perform, and they just did it. And in part, this is again about this idea that women's luxury activities depend on the labor always of other women, because really interested in that. I need the, okay. And then what you see happening in the film is this lettuce, this rubber, this blush, from these totally disparate, some real, some fantastical places, combined together and get like all mushed up and the final product is this crazy cube of disgustingness, of lettuce and rubber and blush. And what the heck is it? It's an art object. And here's why I love this piece. This is a photograph that accompanies the video, and it's this very fancy like art dealer woman holding this piece. I love it because it asks us to question the value of the art object. Is something like lettuce, rubber, and blush becoming something valuable just simply because some woman holds it up in a gallery? That's interesting to me. 
And it's interesting, I think, to everybody who says, what's the point of contemporary art? But more importantly, in Mika's video, it's about the real issues facing our world. We consume things and take things that come from very, very far away places. People's jobs and their activities are often determined by the place that they live. These Indian women have, in some ways, no choice but to work at this rubber factory. These Mexican women have, in some ways, no choice but to come be lettuce farmers. And Mika's asking us to think about who are these people out there in the world and how does their labor impact what we do. So I've come to this new place and I really am learning a lot about it. As soon as I got here, I was blown away by the history of MSU as a land-grant university. I was totally blown away by the work being done around agriculture and sustainability and food production. In San Francisco, that's a really hot topic. And in San Francisco, I had worked with some artists who were engaging something that's called social practice, which is really totally different from, I think, what people think of when they think of contemporary art. Social practice is kind of performance art, but with a civic mindedness. I worked with some artists who were thinking globally, but acting locally, so to speak. They were making community gardens. They were changing the way we perceive of where our food comes from. Very much in line with this fantastical piece that Mika Rottenberg did, <coughs> artists are asking us to think about what does it mean to live locally, to live sustainably, but with this mind toward a global context. And this is what I think the Broad Museum can be and needs to be. It's our museum, it's about this place, but it looks at the way what we're doing here impacts and relates to the local world. So I'm really incredibly excited about this project, which will really kind of be the first thing that I do here. I've talked to, I sort of spent my first three weeks here talking to these artists back in San Francisco and one in LA and saying, you guys, this is kind of amazing. All the things you're talking about in practice are being studied here by real leaders in the field. And I started meeting with professors from the School of Agriculture, from all different departments, who were interested in locally sourced food and interested in sustainability and interested in kind of ethical production of food and teaching people how to live locally and think about their impact on the world by, by focusing on their place and looking outside themselves. So it kind of grew slowly, but I'm, we're premiering a project that I think just feels so right for this place, but so relevant for what's happening in the world and in the contemporary art world, the land grant and artists residency project, which invites artists who are working around these topics of food and agriculture to come do a kind of residency, hang out at MSU, and have two things that you don't really get in the art world a lot. The number one thing that you don't get in the art world a lot is actual land. You don't actually get like forests and fields when you're living in the middle of Harlem. And you don't always get access to people who are thinking about these things from a totally non-artistic point of view. The first artist that I'm going to bring to be part of the land grant is a woman named Amy Franceschini, who's part of a collective called the Future Farmers. And Amy um, did a project in San Francisco where she turned the entire plaza of City Hall into a community garden. And people who could, were like walking to work every day could come and be encouraged to like plant some seeds. And then she would give them a little packet of seeds that she had perfectly designed and it was with instructions about how to go and plant them. And this series of kind of collective urban gardens just populated all of downtown San Francisco. And people were sending pictures to SFMOMA that we posted on the website, this kind of zombie overtaking, if you will, of like community gardens with people thinking about what it means to live off of your own land. And of course, they're not completely sustaining themselves, but it's a symbolic movement. This is Amy's sculpture, which is an imagined version of what you need to do urban gardening, a bicycle, wheelbarrow, a pogo stick shovel. The next artist I'm bringing is an artist named Fritz Haig, who's really well known for the project he did called Attack on the Front Lawn, where he worked in, he started in Kansas and now he's done it all over the world, where he asked people living in kind of suburban places to give them, give him their front lawn to just do whatever he would. And he turned it into a vegetable garden, which seems like a really simple act, but it became this sort of political uproar because there's actually like real social status accompanying having a beautifully manicured front lawn. But Fritz is asking us to think about the place we live and how do we turn that into something that's a little bit political. The same way that Mika Rottenberg asked us to think about the place we live can determine the politics of our life and what we do and how we sustain ourselves. 
So if this is a project Fritz did for the Tate Modern in London where they gave him just land in a kind of depressed area of London and he turned it into, again, this big community garden, which just asked people to kind of celebrate their place and think about their impact. So to kick off the land grant, we've put together this kind of think tank experience where I've invited Fritz and Amy to come to MSU. I've invited this woman who started a collective called the Greenhorns, which is about teaching young people to be farmers in America. And there was just an article in the Huffington Post that talked about how the age of farmers is rising and that to live sustainably, to live off of our own materials, we need people to be excited and committed to being farmers and potentially even to being sort of ethically focused or sustainably focused farmers. So Severin has kind of made farming really popular and hip and important. And she's going to come and kind of talk about activist farming. She's made a documentary called The Greenhorns, which is about this. She and the artists and some other people who are farming locally are going to come together and talk. I've invited a series of professors at MSU to come and talk. And the reason I'm doing this is because I really want to explore what does the land grant project look like at MSU. I feel like the Broad Art Museum is poised to kind of be a leader in this field of thinking about artists working with food and working with land and working with space, but with this sort of very specific political focus. And just to start a conversation. So if you live near East, Le if you live near the Broad Art Museum, you may have seen the new windows of the Barnes and Noble, the former Barnes and Noble building, which says Barnes are noble. And apparently there's been a lot of questions about what's going on here. The, someone from the city of East Lansing called me and said, you know, we're, we're, asked, we're being asked if there's a new tenant. Someone else just told me, does this have to do with like barn restoration? Nobody knows, but now you know. Um, we're going to take over this space because this project, the land grant project, is about spaces, interstitial spaces. It's art practice that is not traditional, right? It's part agriculture. It's part politics. It's part farming. It's part science. It's part architecture, and it will live outside the confines of a museum wall. It will live kind of in the interstitial spaces that you find. And for me, you know, I don't actually have a museum building quite yet, and it will open really soon, but even when it does open, I want the projects that we do to kind of permeate out into this place, into this local culture, and make us think about the big things that are happening in the world here and in the world around us, and what is the local impact on the global, and what is the global impact on the local. There, I understand that there's been a little bit of an uproar, controversy is good, a little bit of an uproar between this kind of history that goes on at MSU, between sort of industrial farming and organic farming, and people keep saying, well, are you taking a position? What is your position? And of course, I have a position, and you can probably guess what it is. But the point that I want contemporary art to do and what I want this project to do is not say, here's our position, believe it. It's to say, here are some issues, think about it. Like it, don't like it, but think. This is not a library, this is not church. This is not a place to just come and be lectured at or just look quietly and feel like you don't know how to enter into it. The Broad Art Museum, the Land Grant Project, contemporary art in general, this is about you seeing the world that you live in reflected back at you, and you can take what you will, but I hope that you will discuss and you will examine. And to me, that is the power of contemporary art, and I hope very much that over the next few years, that is what you're gonna see from me and from the museum. Thanks so much.